This podcast is a proud member of the Lamb Podcasting Network. Find the network at largeassmovieblogs.com. Hello and welcome to episode 50 of the 1001 Movies podcast, based on the book, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die. This week we'll be talking about the 1938 film Jezebel, directed by William Wyler and starring Betty Davis. Chris has always loved you and wife. Yes. If he isn't simply bowled over by it, I wonder what Wait a minute. Bring that over here. Mademoiselle. Saucy, isn't it? And vulgar. Yes, isn't it? Come on, get me out of this. Julie, what are you doing? If it fits me, I'm going to wear it to the Olympus Bowl. A red dress to the Olympus Bowl while you're out of your senses. Mademoiselle, jeune fille ne porte pas une robe comme ça. D'ailleurs, c'est une robe de cette Marie Vicaire. That creature, Julie. You heard what Madame Poulard said. That infamous Vickers woman. Mary Vickers couldn't possibly do it justice. Child, you're out of your mind. You know you can't wear red to the Olympus Ball. Can't I? I'm going to. This is 1852, Dumplin. 1852, not the Dark Ages. Girls don't have to simper around in white just because they're not married. In New Orleans, they do. Julie, you'd insult every woman on the floor. Mademoiselle, your aunt, she's right. Look how beautiful this dice is. Will you kindly get me out of this? Julie, you can't be serious. Never more serious in my life. But, Julie, think of press. That's just exactly what I am thinking of. The 1930s were a period of ups and downs for Betty Davis. Although she had been in a number of movies since 1931, it wasn't until 1934 when she starred as a broken and hopeless homewrecker in Of Human Bondage that audiences really started to take notice of her. This was followed a year later with Dangerous, which won her an Academy Award for Best Actress. After this, Warner Brothers had her working in a string of largely unsuccessful and substandard pictures, and it was when she was cast as a lady lumberjack in God's Country and the Woman that she snapped. She refused to abide by her contract with Warner, and instead of doing the movie, she fled to Canada and later to England to avoid being served with the inevitable lawsuit. Warner Brothers did end up suing Davis and litigated the case in an English court. Her lawyers argued that her contract was nothing more than indentured servitude. She was being forced to act in films that just weren't up to the caliber of an Oscar-winning actress. Warner Brothers, of course, pointed out that anyone getting paid $1,350 a week could hardly claim that she was an indentured servant. The court ruled in favor of Warner, enforcing the disputed contract for another three years. Although the court's ruling could only be enforced in England... Davis knew that she had been beaten and returned to Hollywood with her tail between her legs. Jack Warner welcomed her with open arms, promising to let bygones be bygones and that there would be better work for her in the future. Betty Davis was not the only Hollywood actor with a contract dispute. Between herself, James Cagney, and then Humphrey Bogart, they shared a total of 20 suspensions as a result of disobeying the orders of of their studios. In 1944, Olivia de Havilland took Warner Brothers to court and won, as they held an actor's timeout for a suspension could not be tacked onto their contract after its expiration. Jack Warner kept his promises with Davis. He had her star in a succession of successful pictures, and when it was announced that David Selznick had the rights to Margaret Mitchell's epic Gone with the Wind, Selznick inquired whether he might borrow Errol Flynn and Buddy Davis from Warner to star as the film's leads. Davis rejected the idea, stating that she was appalled of Flynn playing Rhett Butler, and that she refused to be part of that parcel. Perhaps as a consolation for missing out on Gone with the Wind, Jack Warner served up another film with southern roots for his star, Jezebel, based on the play by Owen Davis. To direct the picture, Warner borrowed William Wyler from Samuel Goldwyn. When Davis was told that Wyler would be directing her, Her only memory was of a screen test she did for him at Universal in 1931. 
The wardrobe department had her wear a dress that revealed more than she would have cared to, and she distinctly heard Weiler tell his assistant, What do you think of these dames who show their chests and think they can get jobs? When David recounted this to Weiler during the production of Jezebel, he was abashed and apologized profusely, claiming to have no memory of the incident. William Weiler had made quite a name for himself over at Goldwyn Studio, his most popular recent accomplishment being 1936's Dodsworth, which earned Weiler his first Academy Award nomination. The production of this film is a story for another episode, but Weiler had been so lucrative at the time that he managed to squeeze out two more films, Come and Get It and Dead End, before beginning work on Jezebel. Set in New Orleans in 1853, Jezebel is the story of young Julie Marston, played by Betty Davis, who was engaged to be married to Preston Dillard, played by Henry Fonda. Fiercely independent, yet sadly naive, Julie insists on wearing a red dress to the Memphis Ball, an act that flies in the face of all that is proper for a southern belle in the 1850s. As she dances with Preston, she earns the glares of the wealthy and affluent citizens of New Orleans, who instantly blacklist her. Preston breaks off their engagement as a result, and after he visits the North for business, Julie is adamant that she will eventually win him back. Preston does return, but with a charming Yankee bride on his arm. Meanwhile, an epidemic of yellow fever strikes New Orleans, forcing the authorities to quarantine parts of the parish. Preston falls victim to the disease, and in the film's closing moments, Julie braves sickness and poverty by accompanying him to the Lazarus Island. The production of Jezebel was pretty much seamless, and the cast and crew got along like a house on fire. Weiler and Henry Fonda discovered that they shared the same agent, Leland Hayward, who also happened to be the third husband of Margaret Sullivan. Coincidentally, her first two husbands were none other than Henry Fonda and William Weiler. This resulted in the two of them playing a joke on Hayward, in which they both insisted on being removed from the picture, resulting in a candid camera-ish still shot of the three men being taken, which they called the Maggie Sullivan Club. During filming, the two main stars went through major life changes. Davis quietly divorced from her husband, Harmon O. Nelson, and the crew had to work around the birth of Fonda's daughter, Jane. When Jezebel completed filming in January of 1938, a much-publicized search for the actress to star as Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind was underway. It seemed that by the time Jezebel premiered at the Radio City Music Hall in New York in March, the country was abuzz with anticipation of upcoming Civil War epics. David Selznick attended the premiere, and being impressed with the music, he would later hire composer Max Steiner to write the score for Gone with the Wind. Everyone associated with the production came out smelling like roses. The film earned five Oscar nominations, Best Picture, Betty Davis for Best Actress, Faye Bainter for Best Supporting Actress as Julie's Aunt Belle, Best Cinematography, and Best Music. Davis and Bainter both walked away with the gold. William Wyler, of course, would go on to make more classic movies, and this was just the beginning of Betty Davis's career. She would continue making movies until her death in 1989. What did I think of Jezebel? I've watched this twice. The first was several years ago when I went through a marathon of Oscar-winning movies. The second was for this podcast. Both times I admit I've been a little underwhelmed. Sure, this is an old film and I don't expect it to move along at breakneck speed, but it still has the feeling of an opulent Hollywood costume drama, the kind of film that nowadays seems to be made purely to be nominated for Academy Awards. That being said, there is absolutely nothing tangibly wrong with Jezebel. It's a great portrait of the life of a rebellious Southern Belle in the 1800s. The problem is that it lives in the shadow of another picture about the life of an even greater and even more rebellious Southern Belle that was released a year later. In a couple aspects, this is unfortunate because there are a couple scenes in Jezebel that stand out as high points for the actors and directors. I'm talking about the scene in which Preston accompanies Julie to the Memphis Ball and forces her to dance with him, knowing full well that she'll be scorned by everyone there, even after she begs him to stop dancing and he commands the orchestra to keep playing. It's a sad, powerful scene, especially after Julie's stubborn optimism to wear the red gown despite all advice to the contrary. However, the scene is downplayed by the fact that Julie 
after being publicly humiliated and punished by her former fiancé, insists on winning him back. Why? I appreciate her tenacity, but instead of winning the man back, shouldn't she sprout wings and fly above all the social conformity that caused her to be an outcast? Now, granted, this is 1853, but somehow the setting doesn't make the intent of the script less misogynistic. Yes, she eventually does rise up in the end by doing what no one else would dare do, accompany her man headfirst into yellow fever quarantine, but doesn't she deserve better? The highlight of the film is Betty Davis, and I think the film would have faded into obscurity today if it wasn't for her. She's simply delicious in the role. When her co-stars seem to be playing by the book, Davis takes chances without ever going over the top and seeming melodramatic. This isn't the fun, bitchy diva we see 12 years later in All About Eve, but you can see a hint of Davis's own rebellious spirit peeking out beyond the role of Julie Marston. Watching Faye Bainter acting hilariously awestruck and later coining the film's titular moniker was also fun, and I was pleasantly surprised to learn later that she had also won an Oscar. That's all I have to say about Jezebel, and that concludes the first half of the third season of the 1001 Movies podcast. I'll be back in a few weeks with a discussion about 1991's The Rapture, directed by Michael Tolkien. In the meantime, please feel free to email questions or comments to 1001moviespodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at 1001moviespc, and look for the podcast Facebook page. Until next time, happy viewing.